Today's stuff we're going to be learning is Baba Kamadaf Kuftet. Today's stuff is sponsored by Adana Goldberg and Michael Kelman in honor of the marriage of their daughter Noam to Avichai Klugerman last night in Israel. May these two chayalim build a bayin and man be Israel, and may the schut of our learning keep all the soldiers safe. Amen and Mazal Tov. Okay, we're going to get started right now with, one second, let me just make sure I did that. Okay. We're going to get started with the Mishnah at the bottom of Daf Kuftet. I'm a bet. The first thing we're going to start with is a law that we've seen already a number of times, but or at least maybe once before, something we should be familiar with. If not, anyway, it's great review. We're now going to talk about a shomer who's watching somebody's item, and then the person comes and says, where is it? And they're going to claim either it was lost or it was stolen, which means we're talking about a shomer finam who can exempt themselves from gneva or aveda, which means if it was stolen or lost, they're exempt as long as they take an oath. So now we're going to have someone who actually lies, says it was either lost or stolen under oath, and then either witnesses are going to come and say, you lied, or they're going to admit it themselves. And then the, the, we're going to have four different possibilities. They claimed it was lost or they claimed it was stolen. That's already two. And within each of those, either witnesses will come and say, you lied under oath, or they're going to admit that they lied under oath. And what's going to be the halacha in each case? So let's start with the mission. Hecham piktoni. Where is my item? I gave you to watch. Um, Milo, he said, Avad, it got lost. Must be a chani. I'm going to make you take an oath. Vamal, amen. And he said, yes. That's enough to say, yes, I took an oath. Uh, and then the witnesses come and said, it wasn't lost. We saw you eat it, or we saw you use it and consume it, and it's no longer there. Mishalem, kevin. If you claimed it was lost, this is the big difference between lost or stolen. If you claimed it was lost, even though theoretically you kind of stole it, but you didn't really steal it because you didn't go in someone's house and steal it, well, there's no kefal payment. Okay, this is just a, a fact on the ground. Question why it is. In a more even share, maybe we get into this. But there's a difference between if you claim it was lost or you claim it was stolen. If you claim it was stolen, you're going to have to pay kefal. If you claim it was lost, you're not going to have to pay kefal. You just have to return the principal. Hodame atzmo. This is going to be the same in both cases. If you come forward and admit, we already know what you're supposed to do when you admit. And you want atonement, what do you do to get that atonement? Mishalem, keren, v'chomesh, v'asham. You pay the principal, you pay the fifth extra payment, which is really 25% more, and you have the value of the item, and you pay the korban, asham, the guilt offering. You bring a sacrifice. Hechan piktoni, same thing. Where's my pikadon? But in this case, Amar lo nignav, the shomer this time swore that it was stolen. Must be a chani. I'm going to make you take an oath. I'm out. I'm in. He answers. I'm in to the oath. And witnesses come and said, you stole it. It's in your house. So you pay kefal. There you have to pay the double payment. If you admit on your own, though, then same thing as the previous case. Now we're going to get to a new case, which is the focus of our case today. This is not a different in terms of that. This is just based on that or, or not even. Somebody steals from their own father. Okay, we're talking about a case. Someone steals from their father. Now, this gets a little tricky because what? Well, Nishbalo took an oath that I did not steal. Umate, and then the father dies. Now, the son feels bad, wants to do repentance, comes forward and admits that he stole from the father. What's the tricky part? Who's he supposed to pay? The heirs of the father, but he himself is an heir. So how do we deal with this? To which the Mishnah says, okay, So this is a good ex, ex, uh, case where it's not clear who the pronouns are referring to. His sons or his brothers? Whose sons and whose brothers? So Rashi says the sons of the father, meaning all his other heirs. And if he doesn't have other sons, then it goes to his brothers, who would be the next in line to be his heirs. Meaning the son gets nothing of it. Tosfod and the Rambam have this explanation that it actually is the sons of the, the person who stole, meaning... He can't get it himself, but he can actually give it to his own heirs. But we're not going to go into this whole debate. It's an interesting debate, but not for our purposes today, because we'll never get anywhere. Let's just go with Rashi, that basically you can't have any part in it as the son, because you stole. It's not going to go to you. You have to return it. To return it means give it to somebody else, so you give it to the other heirs of the father. Now, this is a little bit weird. He doesn't want to do this, or, or what? Or in She'elo. Or he doesn't have the money to pay back. So what can he do? And here they come up with a halachic solution, which kind of skirts around the issue. Love, he borrows money. Now, you would think if he borrows money to return this item, and he returns the item to the brothers, and then he has to pay back money for, of his own. But, but the Baalei Chov can come and collect the money from all the brothers equally. 
because what he really did was borrow against the estate of the father. And therefore he gets, he kind of ends up benefiting from this. So it's like a, 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 a circular way of kind of in the end, returning it and actually getting the money for it in a sense. Okay, so it's a little bit strange, but they allow this solution. Um, and Rashi explains it a little better if you want. Kigon, the last line of Rashi here, Im Hayush and on page Kufret, I'm a bet. Kigon, Im Hayush Naim Achiv Hushlishi, Nifraim Balei Chovim, Min Hashavash, Shlish Achov, Vashar Yidvumi Menu. In other words, he's going to take two thirds from the other brothers and one third from him, meaning they're going to help him pay this back. Okay, so in the end, he doesn't lose out entirely. And here we're going to see it in another, this kind of solution they give in another case. Haomer Lebino, Konam Iatan Nehanem Shili. If a father takes a vow, the son, this is a totally different case, not connected to theft. The father takes, it's just going to have the same type of solution. The father takes a vow, the son cannot benefit from me. Okay, this doesn't apply if a father says, you will not benefit from me. It means in his lifetime. But once the father's no longer alive, getting um, money in Yerusha, in inheritance, is not really considered benefiting from the father. Unless the father says, the chayavu b'moto. If the father says, I'm taking a vow that my son will not benefit from me, right? Unfortunately, we see the situation where parents, you know, write their kids out of, you know, any, any financial benefit in my life and when I die, then it's clear he means you will not inherit from me. Inmate lo yirashena. And in fact, when the father dies, this child does not inherit at all. So again, who gets it, right? Again, assuming we go with Rashi's interpretation, all the other heirs will get the money and not this one. But vim ain't low. But if he doesn't have any money and he needs money, love ubalecho ba'im benefchim. He borrows money, and the creditors can come and get it from the estate because this is considered indirect benefit. Okay, because he's not really benefiting directly. Now, of course, he is benefiting from the estate because they're going to partially pay back his loan. But it's called indirect benefit, and because it's indirect benefit, because in the end, who's taking the money from the estate? Not him, but his creditors. So he can borrow against the estate basically is what it's saying. Okay, we're going to leave that case. We're going to go back to our case now. So our case is we have a child, and this is the main thing we're going to focus on right now. We have a child who stole from the father. The father died. The child admitted, has to return it. To who does he return it? Well, he brings it to the other heirs because the father is now dead. Amr of Yosef, Rav Yosef says, and this is the key line that we're going to deal with for the rest of a uh, while of our shir today, which is this and the truth is, it's going to be the whole year because we're going to get off from there on a tangent into something else. Okay, Rashi says we're talking about if there, if he can't, actually Rashi says in a weird language, I'll read it inside. If he can't find any other heirs of the father to return it to, it's a weird language. It should be if there aren't any heirs. So some of the commentaries say it means if they live really far away and it's very hard to return it to them or something like that. If we want to find some sort of solution and we don't have any other options, okay, maybe, okay, that's Rashi. There are different interpretations. Maybe in, in any case you can, but let's just go with Rashi. In a case where you can't find anyone to return it to, you give it to Tzedaka, okay? Right, we do this a lot where, you know, you're having an argument for a friend who's paying and you can't, you know, so the other one says, fine, I'll give the money to charity, you know? And you're using charity here Right, for two things. You're, in the end, you're giving charity, but you're also returning your lost item, and that's okay. That's what Rav Yosef comes and says, even though you're giving it to charity. The point is, you have to get rid of this item from your house. And if you have no other way to do it, then give it to charity. Okay? Because you have no one to give it to. I'm Rav Papa. Rav Papa says, well, just with one minor issue here, which is, or one caveat, Tzarich Shilman Zed Gezalavi. You have to say, this is my father's stolen item. You can't just you know, exactly what you just wrote, Harry, right? So they have to be donated in the Father's name. You have to say it. You can't just give money for charity and then later say, oh, yeah, I gave a donation. That counted for that. No, you have to specify it at the time why you're doing it. But now let's go back to Rabbi Yossi. This is what's really going to bother us. This seems to imply that you cannot... Okay, now in the end, who owns this? You're on both sides of the coin here. You're the one who's supposed to pay. And you're also the one who theoretically is the only one representing the Father to receive it. And what we're basically, Rav Yosef is saying is, you can't do that. You can't just say, I'll accept my own theft, right? You have to give it somewhere else. But am I? Nim chalei Can't you just say to yourself, okay, self, right? I'm going to, I don't care about the, the, the theft, okay? I'm going to be mocha, right? Mocha say, I'm going to pardon this theft. Now, why do we think that you could do such a thing? 
Well, Milo Tznan, doesn't it say in the Mishnah? Machalo ala kerem velo machalo ala chomesh. Do you remember there was a case where Daf Kufkim Olamud Aleph, it said, if someone says, oh yeah, you don't have to return me the Karen, right? Because remember, the Karen is the part you have to actually make sure it gets to the hands of the Gazlan. But theoretically, the Gazlan, uh, the Nigza, the one who was stolen from, theoretically, the person who was stolen from could say, I, I don't, I don't, you don't need to return it to me. So it seems clear that there is such a concept of Mechila. So Alma Bar Mechila, from here you learn that theoretically, someone could be Mochel on the Karen and you wouldn't have to return the principal. So, why can't you just be mochel to yourself? Okay, since you're the only one who's supposed to receive it, you could just say, oh, self, I, you know, I don't need to. Now, obviously, it sounds a little silly, and that's why I'm saying it in that way. We're going to see, and this is very important to understanding the continuation, there's a difference between being mochel, me, to somebody else, or being mochel to myself, right? If there's two people, it makes sense that one could say, I pardon you, right? And it's okay, you don't have to return it to me. But to say it to yourself is a little bit more tricky to say that that would actually work. But right now, they're assuming it's all one and the same. And theoretically, if, if, if Mechila works, then Mechila should work here too. And theoretically, you shouldn't have to pay anybody. You shouldn't have to give it to the stuck. So we're going to have three resolutions to this contradiction. And they're all going to connect to this Mechlok at Rabbi Yossi, Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Yossi Aglili and Rabbi Akiva. About a different topic. And that's a topic we're going to get off on as we go on. So now they say, I'm a Rabbi Yochanan. First answer. Lo kashya ha Rabbi Yossi Aglili ha Rabbi Akiva. Each Mishnah, the Mishnah on Daf Kuf Gimel, is authored by one of them, and our Mishnah is authored by a different one. And each one matches a different approach. One thinks you can do Mechila, one thinks you can't do Mechila. Okay, let's see who's what. So right, our Mishnah doesn't allow for Mechila. That's going to be Rabbi Akiva, who doesn't allow for Mechila in this other Braita. And the other one is Rabbi Yossi Aglili, who allows for Mechila there, would allow for Mechila here. And that's the Mishnah Daf Kuf Gimel. Ditan. Well, let's read this Brayta. Bim ein liish goel hashiva sham. This is a puzzle we're going to deal with a lot today. It's in Bami Bar Hey, chapter five, verse eight. Bim ein liish goel hashiva sham elav. If the person who stole does not have someone to return the item to, hasham hamushav lahashem lakohen. Okay, it's a bit of a weird language, but what it means is the item that you have to return should be given to God which means to the Kohen, because we can't give anything to God. The Kohen were the representatives of God. You bring it to the temple and give it to the Kohen. Milvan, how do we know you give it to the temple? You'll see right now. In addition to the El Kippur and Meshayi Chupar Ba'alav. Obviously talking about someone who comes in and bids. This is where the Pasuk about the Viduin comes in that we saw before. The confession. You confess, and then you give it to the Kohen, and you give it along with, okay, if there's no one to return it to, Okay, because the person has no heirs. In a minute, we'll see who that is, because who and what Jewish person doesn't have relatives. Okay, so we'll get to that. But what happens? You bring it to the Kohen in addition to your Korban Hashem. Because what happens with the Korban Hashem? Do you remember? It's like a chatat where the meat gets eaten by the Kohen. Okay, so basically you're giving it to a Kohen. He's going to end up with the meat of the Korban that he sacrifices for you. And he's going to get the money that you're returning. Now, to which the Brayta says, the Chiyesh Adam Yisrael She'en Legali. Is there such a Jew that doesn't have re- redeemers? Meaning everybody's got some relative. If it's not, you don't have children, you have brothers. If you don't have brothers, you have your father's uncles. If you don't have your father's uncles, you have, you, know, you, you can always find some relative. We'll get, when we get to Dine Yerusha and all that, you'll see. Ela begezel hagera kachuk dabeo. What's it talking about? You just basically keep going up generations and you find somebody who's related. So we must be talking about a convert. Because a convert, so they basically say this pasuk refers to a convert, and what it means is, if you go to return money to a convert, okay, we'll read it right now, okay, you stole money from a convert, and then you lied about it, okay, and you said, I didn't steal. And then you hear that the gear died. Now, this is a bit of a strange point they're going to bring out in this Mishnah, which is you hear the gear died, and you thought the gear was dead. In a minute, we're going to see the gear wasn't actually dead. It's a bit of a weird, it, it, you could tell this case without it, but you heard the gear died. And you're now on your way. You, you, know, you decided to repent after you heard the gear died. For, I don't know if it's because you heard the gear died, but in any case, you felt, oh, wow, I can't believe I didn't deal with this. And you now go to deal with it. You, you confess. You now bring your korban. You're going to Jerusalem with your sacrifice. And you're going to now, what do you do? There's no gear. And the, the gear is not there anymore to return it. And the gear's children are not in existence. It doesn't have heirs. Remember, a gear that um, converts is as if they're reborn. 
So that means any relatives from before the conversion are not considered their relatives, even if all their relatives converted. It doesn't matter. Their relatives are not their relatives. The only ones who are their children that are born after the conversion. So this person obviously didn't have children. If they had children, it would be a different story. You're now on your way to Jerusalem, bringing this item that you stole and lied about. Who do you have it to meet on the way? The convert who you thought was dead. Now, you would think you would just pay him the money. Ah, oh, you're here. I'm about to give my money to the temple. I now I realize I don't have to give to the Kohanim. I'm going to give to you. But instead of doing that, you said, listen, can I borrow the money for a little while? I have your money. I'm going to return it to you now that I see you're alive. But can we just wait a few days? I need the money for, you know, maybe I need to buy things along the way. Can I just have it for another few days? And the gear says, sure, no problem. Oh, mate. And in the meantime, the convert dies. Actually dies. So now they say, now what happens when a convert dies? All the convert's property becomes ownerless, and anyone who comes along is allowed to take ownership of it. So basically, what Rabbi Yossi Aglili says, and the question is going to be why he says this, okay? But Rabbi Yossi Aglili says in this case, the person who stole the money, let's say it's me, I stole the money. I go to give it to the convert. I basically didn't give it to the convert, right? But now that the convert's dead and I go to return it, so either we're going to see it turned into a loan. It's no longer theft because I already said I'm going to return it and then it got turned into a loan. But the first explanation isn't going to view it that way. The first explanation is going to say that what is Rabbi Yossi Aglili view here? That what? Once I can return the money to the convert once he's dead. I can't really, right? But basically I am like the convert, because as soon as, if this is ownerless, then I own it right now. Because if it's ownerless and it's in my possession and it really belongs, right? I have something I'm supposed to return, belongs to the gear, but it now is ownerless and I'm owning it now. So I can just take it from healthcare and it can be mine and I can play both sides now. So I can just cancel the loan. And that means I can cancel it to myself. Okay, that's the way Rabbi, Rabbi Yochanan is going to understand this. And therefore, Mechila works even between me and myself and obviously between me and other people. And that's going to match the Mishnah on Dapkuf Gimel, which said you can be mocha the Karen, because here Mechila works. Rabbi Akiva Omer, Elo Takanaj, Yotzi Gzela Mitach Yado. Rabbi Akiva says, no way, no how. You have to take that item out of your possession, okay? Doesn't work. Okay, there's a big question, and I'm not gonna get into this, why they had to give a super complicated case when you thought the gear was already dead, okay? It doesn't really seem germane to the issue, and it's really not germane to the issue. This could have just happened if the gear had, had died, okay? If you had said to the gear, yes, I admit I stole it, and I'm just not taking it right now, right? In other words, I'll, I'll give it to you. I'm just not giving it to you right now. I'll give it to you later. Turned it into a milva, okay? Although we'll see again. Rabbi Yochanan doesn't think the milva part is so important either so much. But basically, we'll leave that point aside. Some of them say it's there to point out, even though you thought you were going to give it to the Kohen, Still doesn't necessarily go to the coin. You can actually keep it for yourself, according to Rabbi Yosef. Clearly, anyway, it's a side point. Even though it kind of makes the story funny, also the situation kind of funny, um, or maybe not so funny, but kind of a strange situation that you thought the person was dead, and then you're on the way walking and you bump into them. In any case, we'll leave that point aside. Let's stick with the main ideas of our sugi here. So Rabbi Akiva says, "There's nothing you can do. You must return this lost item." Meaning, what's Rabbi Akiva's all approach? You want to repent? You can't repent with a stolen item in your property. I don't care that it's kafal ab bemilvet, you know, that you turned it into a loan. It doesn't matter. It's still a stolen item. Whether you turned it into a loan or didn't turn it into a loan, let's just talk about the comparison between a loan and a, and a theft. If I borrow money from you and then, you know, let's say you're a convert, you die, you have no heirs. I don't have any moral obligation to get that money out of my possession. First of all, we always say, it's not, not, the, not the same money in any case. I, I loan money. That was a permissible thing. And okay, so I got lucky. But, and you got unlucky. But in the case of a theft, there's a moral responsibility. You have a stolen item in your possession. Or even if the item's not your possession anymore, you stole something and never returned it. So comes Rabbi Yakima and says, you must get rid of that stolen item. You have a moral responsibility to get rid of it. Fine, he's not there to, well, give it to, you know, give it to the coin. Okay, you've got to get it out of your possession. So, now comes Rabbi Yochanan, makes a few points, and you're not sure why he's making these points, but he's really explaining his opinion better, and it's going to be what Rabbi Sheshit is going to attack him about. And that's why it's here. The Rabbi Yossi Aglili Loshna Now, remember, let's just start from the beginning. Rabbi Yochanan said this resolves our contradiction. The Mishnah Dav Kuf Gimel said there is such a concept of mechila by a stolen item, as, as opposed to what we said, right? 
You don't always have to return it. If the other side says you don't have to return it, then you don't have to return it. They can say, we don't care. So now, what do you see? That matches, right? That matches Rabbi Yossi Aglili, who said, in the end, you don't have to return this item. You can be, you can actually gain rights to the item. And what he says is, that Rabbi Yossi Aglili's case is really between you and yourself, because you function on both sides here. So you can be mochel to yourself because you're coming in as the gear on that side, right? You're saying, oh, well, the gear, it's the owner of this, right? I'll give it back and I'll take it back. And it's as if I said, oh, yeah, but there's really no stolen item here. So let's take that to, so that is going to, we're now going to say, now the Mishnah there was talking about somebody being mochel to somebody else. But comes Rabbi Yochanan and it says, he doesn't care whether it's Latzmo, Lachirim, you can be mochel to yourself, you can be mochel to others, which means in our Mishnah, when we're talking about you being mochel to yourself, he would disagree with our Mishnah. He would say, our Mishnah doesn't match Rabbi Yossi Aglili, according to Rabbi Yossi Aglili, if there's no other heirs, you could just say, oh, you don't have to pay it back, you don't have to give it to a stucca charity or something, you don't have to actually take it out of your property. But our Mishnah must follow Rabbi Akiva, who says very explicitly, right, you must get this out of your possession. And then Rabbi Akiva's position would be whether it's yourself, whether it's someone else, even someone else, you can't do mechila. <coughs> Excuse me a second. Now, that's the first point Rabbi Yochanan makes here. So number, well, let's say second point. The first point is each mission matches a different opinion. <coughs> the second point he makes is the Rabbi Yosef Lili Loshan Alav She Loshan Alav Cherem Matzi Machil. Rabbi Kiva thinks you could. I'm uh, uh, sorry. Rabbi Yosef Lili thinks across the board it doesn't matter yourself. You can be mochel even, and obviously to somebody else. And the Rabbi Kiva Loshan Alav Cherem the Loshan Alav She Lo Matzi Machil. According to Rabbi Kiva, you cannot be mochel not even to somebody else. Of course, not to yourself. Ule Rabbi Yossi, and one more point he makes, so he makes three points. One is, you know, we're going to split. Each mission is a different opinion. Number two, each one holds the opinion across the board. Yes, mechila all the way, no mechila all the way. Third thing, the fact, hi, dekatani, zekafo'ala b'milve. This is the kafola. oh, sorry, the Rabbi Yossi, hu adin da'afilu lo zekafo'a b'milve. Rabbi Tarf, I'm sorry, Rabbi Yossi Aglili would think the same thing even if you hadn't turned it into a loan. If let's say you meet the gear, and right when you meet the gear, the gear drops dead, okay? Whatever reason, or you know, the gear is still alive at some point, dies at another point, it doesn't matter. Even if you didn't say to the gear, here's your lost, here's your stolen item, I'm gonna give it back to you, but you know what, I'll give it to you in a week. Even if you didn't do that, it would still work. You wouldn't have to pay anybody because you, whenever the gear dies, if you hadn't paid it back yet, even if it wasn't turned into a loan, it's still theft. He doesn't care because theft can't be mochel. You can pardon it. So then the question is, why did the bride to bring up a case of Zakfala b'milve? Well, hai t'katan is Zakfala b'milve. Lo odia ha kocho de Rabbi Akiva. Da afilu Zakfana la b'milve e'en lo takana t'shutzi z'ilam mitach ha'yadam. It's for Rabbi Akiva's position it was mentioned. Because Rabbi Akiva, remember, Rabbi Akiva says, I don't care that you turned it into a loan. It doesn't matter. You still have someone stolen item in your possession you must return it. You're not going to get atonement. Because remember, that's the whole thing. You're going for the Asham here. You're going for your own atonement. You can't get atonement unless you return this stolen item. So that's Rabbi Yochanan's approach. It's a very simple approach because everybody is, is black and white. Okay? It's either, yes, there's pardoning. No, there's no pardoning. If there's no pardoning, then no pardoning, even if you turned it into a loan. There's no such thing. It's a stolen item. Once a stolen item, always a stolen item. Doesn't matter. You can be mochel to yourself. And all the more so... You know, even, sorry, even someone you would have thought maybe you could be mochel to someone else. No, you can't. That's Rabbi Akiva. Rabbi Yossi Agli, across the board says you can pardon. You don't even need to turn it into a loan. No matter what, you can pardon a stolen item. Anyone. And even to yourself. Okay, so now you have to keep in mind Rabbi Akiva, with the chidush, like the more extreme part of what he says, is even to somebody else you can't pardon. And Rabbi Yossi Aglili is, even to yourself, you can pardon. Even if you're on both sides, you can, you know, play both sides. I'm thinking of like a movie where they film someone doing the same, you know, you have these scenes where someone's talking on one side of the phone, talking on the other side of the phone. You know, they're, they like to play both jobs all at once. And somehow you can play with the screen that they're kind of everywhere. So, or play with the filming. So here you can play both sides. That's more complicated to say that. Well, Matsky Flower, because because what's the meaning of pardoning yourself, right? Pardoning really means, okay, I don't mind that you stole from me, but you're talking to yourself? I mean, seriously, that's not really pardoning. But yet, Rabbi Yossi really allows it. So Matsky Flower of Shesha, Rosh Hashanah says, you're, 
this can't be right what you're saying because you're basically saying the Mishnah that talks about Rabbi Yossi Aglili's position is the one that talked in, in Dav Kuf Kim. The, our Mishnah is written in the name of Rabbi Akiva. Now, I'll tell you what doesn't jive here, he says. Ihachi l'Rabbi Yossi Aglili l'shminan l'nafsheh. If Rabbi Yossi Aglili's big new added thing is that even to yourself you can pardon, then the Mishnah that he authored should have been in the more extreme case. Now, what was the case there where the one who was stolen from, not himself, right, or herself, pardon the thief, somebody else. Now, it should have been Rabbi Yossi Aglili to teach us really his position. If you're right, his position is an extreme position. No matter what you can be mochal, he should have talked about a case of pardoning yourself, which was our Mishnah. Right? And all the more so you would learn that it would work for other people. If you could pardon yourself, of course you could pardon other people. And then why did Rabbi Yossi Haglili author the Mishnah that talked about other people, which doesn't necessarily teach you about pardoning yourself? And the Rabbi Kiva, Rabbi Kiva should have taken, instead of him picking the Mishnah, the to author, bringing a case specifically where it's you and yourself that you can't pardon, which is the son, right, who stole from the father and the father's dead. And you would have known if you had taken to someone else you can't pardon, you would have known, obviously, to yourself you can't pardon. So it doesn't make any sense, your answer. So therefore, Rav Sheshach offers a different answer. You can explain both according to Rabbi Yossi Aglili. How so? He rejects Rabbi Yochanan entirely and says, First of all, both Mishneot are Rabbi Yossi Second of all, what's the difference? Well, it's the exact difference I pointed out a second ago, a minute ago, which is, Rabbi, right, Rav Sheshit said, notice, Daf Kuf Gimel is a Mishnah about pardoning other people. Pardoning other people works, according to Rabbi Yossi But I just, you're not right that Rabbi Yossi thinks you can even pardon yourself and prove from our Mishnah. Our Mishnah is Rabbi Yossi It's pardoning yourself. It doesn't work. That's why you have to give it to the charity. And that's because you can't pardon yourself. And even Rabbi Yossi Aglili, who thinks you can pardon other people, doesn't think you can pardon yourself. Now, what about the case of the gear? Wasn't that pardoning yourself? Because you kind of played the role of the gear at the end. Because the gear was dead, you kind of came in place of the gear. Well, that's obviously, what does he say? Again, against, Rabbi, against what Rabbi Yochanan said. Um, so why in that case, when you're playing both sides, you're basically saying, I'll operate in place of the gear and I'll take what was ownerless, right? What became ownerless of the gear, I'll take for myself, which is my stolen item that I stole. I'm now going to accept it back. Well, that's because, exactly why it says it there, is it's because it's no longer a stolen item. That was the whole point of the Brayta, why it said, if you turned it into a loan. Now, remember, Rabbi Yochanan said the Chiddush was even Rabbi Akiva doesn't think that works. But according to Rav Sheshet, that's why Rabbi Yosef really thinks it works here. Because it now became a loan. And a loan, there's no moral obligation to return a loan when the person's dead. If it had stayed as a theft, it would stay as theft and you would have to return it. And it wouldn't work to just return it to yourself. You really have to just get it out of your possession. But since you already met the gear and said to the gear, I'm going to return it to you. And can you just give me a few days? It becomes a loan. It's no longer a theft. And that's why Rabbi Yosef really thinks that it doesn't work. But normally with yourself, it will. That's why he thinks it does work. Normally, he thinks with yourself it won't work, okay? And that's the second explanation. And again, what they're basically saying, and it's going to be similar to what Rav is saying, just with a different perspective, but the difference between Mishnah and Kuf Gimel and our Mishnah is yourself and other people. Other people, it works, Mechila. Between you and yourself, Mechila doesn't work. And all seen through the glasses of Rabbi Yossi Agli. Rav is going to say the same thing, but seen through the glasses of Rabbi Akiva. So we have... Option number one, one which is Rabbi Yossi Aglili, one which is Rabbi Akiva. Option two, it's all Rabbi Yossi Aglili, distinguished between others and yourself. And Rabbi says, and, and basically then you'd say Rabbi Akiva holds, there is no such thing as Mechila, not between yourself and not between you and others. Rabbi says, Hava ha Rabbi Akiva, no, they're both Rabbi Akiva. And Ki ama Rabbi Akiva, de lo matzei machel, l'nafsheh, v'alachir, matzei machel. Now we're going to say Rabbi Akiva is the one who makes the distinction. Can you do Mechila? Can you not do Mechila? Well, it depends. Yourself, to yourself, no way, no how. That's our Mishnah. The Mishnah on Daf Kuf Kimel is also Rabbi Akiva, but there he allows Mechila between you and someone else. Okay? Well, uh, someone else can be Mochel to the thief. What's the problem with saying this? Now moving to Amabet. According to this, if Rabbi Akiva holds, and you have to remember, he obviously disagrees with Rabbi Yossi Aglili. So if Rabbi Akiva holds distinction, not you and yourself, but yes, you to someone else, 
Michlad Rabbi Yossi Aglili. What must Rabbi Yossi Aglili hold? Sever afilu lenafshe matzei machel. He thinks you can even be mochel to yourself. Well, this is going to raise a problem. Comes Rab, the Gemara and raises this question on Rabbi and says, wait a minute. The rules of Gezel Hagir work like this. If you steal from a convert, what you're supposed to do is, you're supposed to return it if you want to do repentance. What you generally do is return it to the Kohen. So, Ellen, and that's from the Torah law. Okay, that's that pasuk. Which we said is a ger, because who else doesn't have redeemers? It goes to the Kohen. Now comes the Gemara and asks, if according to Rabbi Yossi Aglili, you can be mochel to yourself, well then, this gezel ager de kamar achman and itina le koanim, how would you ever have a case where you return it to koanim? Anyone who ever stole from a gear would basically just cancel, right? They would basically play both sides. They'd say, oh, the gear's no longer here. It's ownerless. It's in my possession. Great. I'll acquire it. And I now, because it's now mine and I'm playing the role of the gear and I'm also the, the one who stole, I'll just be mochel to myself. And then it would never go to the kohen. To which the Gemara answers, no. Still, there would be a case. I'm a Rava. Rava answers, Hacha b'mayaskina, kishagazal et hagir v'nishpalo, umeit hagil, v'hodala achar mita. We're now going to distinguish between two cases. If I steal from a convert, and then I admit to the convert that I stole it, then, and I'm supposed to return it to the convert, then it's going to basically, when the convert dies and it's still in my possession, I could play both sides and I could be mochel to myself, according to Rabbi Yossi Agli. According to Rabbi Akiva, I can't do that anyway. I have to give it to the Kohen. But according to Rabbi Yossi Agli, when would it go to the Kohen? If I stole from the gear, I didn't, I lied, I swore that I didn't steal. Then the gear dies before I confess. If I confess after, well, there's no gear for it to go to. It automatically, the halacha is, it goes to the Kohen. And then I wouldn't be able to, to say that it would go to me, okay? Then I wouldn't be able to cancel the loan. But if I admitted while he was still alive, the convert then, or she was still alive, then it would actually be able to go to me. Now I say she, and that's really the Gemara's next question. Does the same rules apply for a female convert? And the answer is going to be yes, but let's see how they learn it. So now we're getting off on a tangent about Gazal Hagir. By Ravina. Gazal Hagir at Mahu. What if you steal from a convert, a female convert? Would it be the same law? Now, why would you think it wouldn't be? Well, because of the Pasuk. What does the Pasuk say? Ish. Now, whenever it says Ish, the question is, Ish means a man. Does it mean a man, a man and not a woman? Or does it mean a man, a grown man and not a child? So we're going to have to figure out. Okay, or, or possibly, by the way, option number three is, it's not really coming to exclude anything. It just means a man, which um, you know, we all know in language, and especially in the Hebrew language, generally the, the, the default is masculine, and that includes women as well. So, and it might even include children as well. It's just a general term. So they say, which one is it? of Aharon, someone who appears only twice in Shas, by the way. Rav Aharon says to Ravina, Tashma, let's learn it from here. We have a bright that basically says this, Ditani. Ish and Leela Ish. Okay, when you see the word Ish, sounds like just a man. Ish Shami Nain. How do we know also if she's a female convert that you stole from? The same laws would apply again if they have no heirs. It goes to the Kohen. Kishu Omel Hamushav Hare Kanshnai. Okay, the Pusik says it's a very weird language. It says if the person doesn't have a redeemer, to meaning a rel, right, uh, an heir, to return, okay, Lahashiv, that's the first Lahashiv, to return the Ashami Lav, the guilty item. Okay, here the Asham doesn't mean the Korban Asham, it means the guilty item, the, the stolen item. Hashem Hamushav, the, the returned stolen item, la Hashem la Kohen, goes to the Kohen. The weird language is Hashem Hamushav, it's a little bit weird in terms of Hebrew language and the way it's used, but anyway, the point is it says la Hashim, and it says Hamushav. That's using the same word twice in an unnecessary manner, hare kanchnaim, which includes man and woman. Im ke matam so why does it say ish then? What are we learning from ish? Well, what it teaches you is if you stole from a male convert or even a female convert, as long as they were grown, you have to go look and see maybe they had children after they converted who would actually be their legitimate heirs. So you have to really do a good search before you bring it to the coin to make sure there aren't any real heirs. But a katan, if it's a minor, it's obvious because the only relatives that uh, young convert could have, assuming they converted, right? Not that they're children of converts, but if they converted themselves, then they don't have any children because they're minors and they obviously have no other heirs because any siblings they have, right, wouldn't be their siblings because 
would be their siblings halachically in terms of inheritance because they were they were converts. So and they were all like we said, katan It's like they're reborn. So you would know a katan doesn't have heirs, so you don't even have to look further. That's the difference. The only difference between an ish and a katan, and that's what we get from the pasuk. Okay, now we're going to go off to which kohen gets it. This is going to sound a little bit more like the issue of. Um, Yoma, if you remember in Yoma, that we talked about all these issues of the Kohanim fighting over rights for all sorts of things. So they had to make it very clear who which Kohanim get it, because there's a lot of Kohanim, and they could all fight over this. So we said a Gezel Adir goes to the Kohen. To which Kohen? So if you're bringing back this item that you stole from this convert in a case where you'd have to bring it to the Kohen, what Kohen gets it? La Hashem la Kohen. Kana'o Hashem, unitano le So it means basically God acquires it, but what does that mean? God doesn't acquire really anything. Unitano le Kohen shabo God gives it to whoever's working that week in the temple. There was uh, 24 groups of Mishmarot. They would go twice a year, work in the temple. So it would go to the one on that Mishmar. A Talmir, and they would get split equally among whoever was working that week. So now the, the bride continues. A Talmir, the Kohen Shabbat Mishmar. Oh, Enoel, the Kohen Shirtzeh. Maybe it's like Truma. Truma, you get to choose whichever Kohen you get to give it to. So if I steal something and need to return it because I stole from a convert, and now the convert's dead and there's no heirs, I can maybe choose whatever coin I want. How do we know you can't? Well, because the Pesach says, Shuomel, Milvat, El Kiburim, Who gets that? I can't just choose whichever coin I want. That goes to whichever coin is working that week. So therefore, since that one goes to the Kohen on that Mishmar, this one as well. So now the Gemara continues. Tanu Rabbanam with another brighter, again along the lines of this topic. What if the thief was a Kohen? Now, if the thief is a Kohen, what happens here? Maybe the Kohen could say, look, I'm a thief. I stole from a convert. I now want to return the item. The convert's dead. I give it to a Kohen. Maybe I can give it to myself because I'm a Kohen. I could play both sides. Well, first they're going to suggest in this bright Vidinhu. And it would be logical for two reasons, even though the first one doesn't really fully work. We'll see why. The Gemara doesn't even reject it. Some people say because it's obvious it's rejected. The second one they're going to reject. Okay, and then they're going to say, and that's how we know it goes to the Kohenim in that Mishmar, and it doesn't go to the same Kohen who stole it. Vidinhu. Okay, here it's logical. Okay, let's say I'm on the Mishmar that week. So I can get whatever other people stole. Atzmolo koshakeng, right? In other words, then I would share it with whoever else is in the Mishmar. So if it's my own, shouldn't I get to keep it entirely? Now that doesn't make any sense for a Kavachomer world, because remember what we learned? When you learn something logically, you can't extend it even farther than the first. The first was I have to share it equally. This, this is trying to say, but then if, if I stole it, maybe I should get the whole thing myself. But that wouldn't work in a logical argument. So that's a weakness in the first. Rabbi Natan Omer he has a different reading to think maybe I would get it myself. Okay, so there's a whole debate about what this is. Let's just take one of the options of the commentary. Say, let's say a sacrifice. A coin brings a sacrifice to the temple. Now, if I'm working that week, the coin could decide, even though they're not working that week, they want to do all that. They get all the meat and all the, the skin, the hide, all that stuff. Now, so I don't have a part in a Kohen sacrifice, even if I'm working in the temple that week, unless the Kohen says to me, I want you to do the sacrifice, then it will become mine. So once the Kohen gives me permission to do this, no one can take it away from me. It's mine, all mine. Okay, this this Kohen is going to work a little better because that's when we want to get to the conclusion. We want to find something that's all mine. So even though I'm working with other people that week, if the coin designates me to bring the sacrifice, I get all the meat, the hide, all that. Therefore, logic would state that that was something I had nothing to do with, and theoretically I never would have had anything to do with if that coin decided to sacrifice it themselves. But if I stole it, now remember, if I steal it, it's, it's in my possession right now. So even before I get permission to use it. So once I get permission to get it, because I'm working on the Mishmar that week and I'm returning my own stolen item, can't, would it be obvious then that I would say I get exclusive rights to this? Because if it's something I had nothing to do with, that then the coin could give me exclusive rights to it. This I already had something to do with it. Shouldn't I be able to give myself exclusive rights to it? To which the Gemara says, look, it doesn't work. Why not? And they're going to knock out the second Kabbalah Homer. But it's not the same. 
Because the first item was the sacrifice that a Kohen was bringing. And not only did you not have rights to it, none of the other people in your Mishmar have rights to it. And that's why when the Kohen gives it to you, it's exclusively to you. But Shomar Begezel, but in the Gezel case, Shekashem Sheyesh Lo Chelek Bo, Kach Yesh Lo Acherim Chelek Bo. But it's not the same. Because you had a part in it, but so did all the other Kohenim. Because anyone working on that Mishmar are the ones who were supposed to get it. So you can't take rights away from them. In the first case, they had zero rights to it until that guy chose you. So that's where you get everything. In this case, where it's Gezel Agir, when you bring it to the temple with your sacrifice, even if you're working in the temple that week, all the people working that week have equal rights to it. So you can't take away their rights. And therefore, conclusion is, So basically, you have to take this item out of your possession and it gets split evenly among all the Kohanim. Now they ask a question. But there's a passage that basically teaches you the Salacha was saw before. That a Kohen can basically decide, even though I'm not in the Mishmar, I'm bringing the sacrifice and I'm getting everything from it. Which means in this case, you come to the temple on a week you're supposed to anyway. And you say, oh, right, you, you're smart about it. You say, I'll do it on the week. I'm, so now I'm going to return the item. I'm going to bring my sacrifice. Now for my sacrifice, I can choose that I'm going to get the meat from because I'm a Kohen and I'm allowed to do that. So shouldn't the money go hand in hand with that? that I should basically get the money also that goes along with the sacrifice. I'm returning the money. I get the money myself because I'm a Kohen. Ha, Chabimayas. So now to answer that question, we either have to say, we're going to try this answer, but it's not going to work. Ha, Chabimayas, can I be Kohen Tamei? Maybe it's only a Kohen Tamei doesn't get the full rights because a Kohen Tamei can't bring the sacrifice. If you can't bring the sacrifice, well, then you can't get full rights to it and you have to split it. But if you bring the sacrifice, since you get the meat of the sacrifice, you should also get the money that goes along with it. But the Gemara says that you can't be talking about a Kohen Tamei. Because if it was an impure Kohen, our whole logical argument we were bringing was obviously about a Kohen who could bring his own sacrifice. That was the whole idea. So this whole bright time can't be talking about a Kohen Tamei. So option two is to say, We'll finish with this point. The reason is that we learn this from the case of a Steh Huzah. A Steh Huzah, without getting into all the details, we're at the end of class, but it's a unique type of field that can't, that you have basically a year to buy it. If you sell it, you have a year to buy it back. And then it can be sold to anybody, even a Kohen. And in the Jubilee year, it goes to the Kohanim. Okay, Jubilee year, usually things go back to their ancestral um, their ancestral, you know, land. This type of land, if you didn't buy it back, it's a, it's a unique type of land that goes to Kohanim in the Jubilee year. That's the main thing you have to know right now without getting into too many details. Now we're going to say, what if we're going to have a comparison here? It's the same thing there. It goes to the Kohen. The Kohanim gets split by the Kohanim that are working that week. Now, comes the, the bright and says, we're going to learn that whatever is true for there is true for here. And that's why, even if you're the Kohen who stole it, you don't have any more rights to it than your other brothers. So why is this? What do you learn from this word, achuzato, in the Pasuk? Okay, it basically says, um, No, sorry. It's like a stecherem, it goes to the Kohen. Okay, this is what happens to this ancestral field that wasn't bought back by its owners in a certain period of time. It ends up reverting to Kohanim in the Jubilee year. Now, what if it was bought by a Kohen? What happens to it in the Jubilee year? Does that Kohen say, hey, look, it's going to go in the Jubilee year to Kohanim, so I'll get it. You cannot say, Hey, look, it's going to go to Kohanim anyway in the Jubilee year, and I already bought it temporarily, right? Because you know you're only buying it to the Jubilee year. But in the Jubilee year, when it goes to Kohanim, ah, who better to choose than me? It's already in my possession. And it's logical to say that. If I was working in the temple that week, I would get other people's ancestral fields, by the way. It's good incentive to want to be, right, on that week of the Jubilee year. Basically, it sounds like whatever Kohanim were working that week, get all the you know, all the lands of people, I would be Zoha, so we shall koshke, and all the more so, I should get other people's. Talmud Lomar, kisteh acherem lakohen tiya achuzato. What does that teach you? Achuzato, achuza shelo, ve'en zo shelo. The lands that go to Kohanim on the Jubilee year are lands that are ancestral fields of the Kohanim. If their ancestors owned it, then they get to keep it. But not, they don't get to keep lands that were other people's that refer to Kohanim in the Jubilee year. Who gets it instead? Goes to the Kohanim that are in that Mishmar, it gets divided up. Okay, so basically they say, ah, we're going to learn from Steh to Gzela. You don't have any unique individual rights. And that's how they explain it in the end. Why you don't get to keep it if you're the thief. Okay, so quick review. 
starting with the difference between to intan and avad and to intan akanav. To intan and avad who lies under oath doesn't pay the kefal. The to intan akanav does pay the kefal. And we got into this whole case, which got us into the whole thing for today's stuff. Someone who steals from their father doesn't return it to themselves, right? They return it to the heirs. If there are no heirs, came Rav Yosef and said, you have to give it to the stuffy. You can't be mochel yourself. Doesn't that contradict the mission of Kuf Gimel? Three different ways we saw to explain that. From that, we got into Gezel Aguer. From that, we got into Gioret also. Not only Gero, also Gioret. What if it was a, um, the, who, which Kohanim get it when you steal from a Gear and then it goes to the Kohanim? In what case does it go to a Kohen? What if the, the thief was a Kohen? That was where we ended with, if the thief himself is a Kohen, does he get to get it? And the answer is no. He doesn't have any more exclusive rights to it than anyone else who's working that week in the temple. And that, in the end, we just learned from this Zereshava, the same words appear, la Kohen, la Kohen, by Stechuza, and also here, in the same way in Stechuza, it doesn't work, it doesn't go to the Kohen, revert back to the Kohen who bought it in the interim. No, it goes to the Kohanim that are on that week. Therefore, it'll also go, this one will go as well. Okay, we'll stop here for today. We'll start the next Brighton, which is connected, but a whole new Brighton, which continues on the next stuff in tomorrow, on tomorrow's stuff. Wishing everyone a great day. The registration for the scene was up, so please register. Um, you'll get a Zoom link, a personal Zoom link, um, and hopefully everybody will join. If you're in Israel, there's Zooms going on in different places in Israel. You can check your local communities. If you're outside of Israel, you can either try to organize a Zoom or you can join a Zoom that's already being organized if, uh, if your group is organizing, so you can check what's going on there. Wishing everybody a great day.